your source for everything paranormal. Paranormal. Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the souls and make things happen, and we're brought to you every week on the Parax Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'm going to be doing the channeling tonight. Connie, my wife, will be asking the questions of our spirit guests. I'd like to thank all of you that take time to listen to our show and even join us in the chat room. Your questions are always appreciated. All of our shows are available for download on Podomatic.com. Please tell your friends about us. We'd love to grow our audience. Now, we always give a small disclaimer because we have no idea what our spirit guests are going to say. So the opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits and do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or of our sponsors. Now tonight, it's going to be a very interesting show. We're going to be introducing the famous Roman Emperor, Augustus. Before he became emperor, he was also known by the name Octavian. Roman history is quite complex, so I'm going to give you a small background of information that's going to help you appreciate our show a little bit better. The Roman Republic was founded in 509 BC. Now keep in mind that a republic is ruled by the people and not by a monarch or a dictator. It was ruled by the Senate, whose members were the wealthiest and most powerful families in Rome. As the size and power of the empire grew, Many of the citizens and military leaders attempted to gain more power. These struggles led to hostilities and civil wars that, that plagued the Republic. Now, jo Julius Caesar was a military leader and politician who rose to power and, and by 40, 46 BC took over control of the government and proclaimed himself a dictator for life. He weakened the government by the people, and basically took over. Members of the Senate feared Caesar would become a tyrant, and with this new title of dictator, would become a serious menace. So they conspired and assassinated Caesar on 44 BC. Brutus and Cassius were the main organizers of the assassination. Now Octavian who would become Caesar Augustus in the future, and our guest tonight was born in 63 BC. Caesar was his maternal great-uncle. When Caesar was assassinated, his will named Octavian as his adopted son. He gave Octavian his name, estate, and the loyalty of all of Caesar's legions. Oct Octavian formally adopts the name Augustus in 27 BC. Now, Mark Anthony thought that he would be named by Caesar to take over the empire. Anthony was one of the, was uh, Caesar's strongest military guy, very powerful in the time. So now you got a conflict. In the beginning, Anthony and Octavian attempt to destroy the armies of Brutus and Cassius because they're the guys that were behind killing uh, Julius Caesar. They fought a civil war. They defeat Brutus's people. So now you have, now you have Anthony and Octavian trying to rule together. Well, Anthony meets Cleopatra. And everybody starts to believe that he's going to make her his wife. And that would, you would have an Egyptian that would be controlling the Roman Empire as the wife of Antony. 
So now we've got another civil war between Octavian and Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Octavian defeats Antony and Cleopatra, comes back to Rome, very popular, and they name him Augustus. So from here on out, you're not going to hear the name Octavian applied to him, but uh, the people of Rome refer to him as, as Caesar Augustus. And they start to put all the powers upon Augustus that an emperor would have in the empire. So anyway, 27 BC is generally considered the date that the Roman Republic ends and the Roman Empire begins. Connie? Uh, Augustus ruled the Roman Empire until his death in 14 AD, a period of 40 years at the age of 77. Ruling for this long was quite a feat, considering the average time of an emperor ruled was eight years. Augustus is considered the greatest of the Roman emperors. All of our shows are available on our YouTube channel in Barry's name, or if you would like to download them, just go to Potomatic.com and search for Channeling History. Now, when we begin our channeling tonight, Connie's going to ask the questions, and I will answer in the words of Augustus. But before we channel, Connie always says a prayer of protection. So, let's, Connie, say the prayer, and we'll get on with our channeling. Okay. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Okay, Connie, let's get on with uh, speaking with our guest, Caesar Augustus. Okay, well, Augustus, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Welcome. Would you like to begin with a message? Yes, I believe I would. It's obviously been a long, long time since I was the head of the Roman Empire. I'm kind of amazed that people still remember me. I thought that I did quite a bit for the empire. I tried to do the best I could. And I think the people rewarded me by allowing me to serve for quite a long time. So thank you for still remembering who I am. Thank you for allowing me to come through and speak. And uh, it's been over 2,000 years since I've been able to speak to anyone, so I do appreciate what you're doing for me. So I know you have many questions. So if you would like to begin, I'm here. I would like to begin. <clears throat> have you lived any lives since your life as Augustus? No, I've not chosen to return as yet. There's a good possibility that I will in the new future because it's been quite a while. Keep in mind that there are there's no time over here, so I'm really not in any rush for it. But no, I had lived a life earlier before Augustus, but I've not lived any life since him. What was life like when you were growing up in the Roman Republic? <clears throat> I was, I was born into a wealthy family, so I had a pretty good life. Um, my father was a member of the Senate, and we had pretty much what we asked for. But the Republic itself was in turmoil. There were many different states in the Republic. Each of these were trying to get more and more attention and power. There were a lot of civil wars between our city-states. There was a lot of turmoil. It was, it was not a time of peace. The citizens of Rome were getting fed up with all the war. We were having troubles on our borders. People were obviously attacking us. The Republic was, was very, very separated at the time. I know that... People think that the Republic or that Rome was always fighting and having disputes among themselves, fighting with the Greeks, and they're correct. So it was 
it was a very, very difficult time. Would you describe the turmoil of the later days of the Roman Republic? Many civil wars. The different republics were, or city-states were recruiting their own legions. They were fighting among themselves. There were, the Senate was very divided. Representation to the Senate had grown to many, many people. There were many senators. Rome was having a great, tro- a great problem governing itself. It was, it was truly a time of great turmoil. Okay. What were some of the most important Roman Republic traditions? Roman Republic was basically based on some of the Greek traditions. The members of the Senate were supposedly elected, and the Senate was supposed to be the final controlling body for the Republic. The senators would vote, and the results of their votes would be supposedly the track that the Republic would take. Much of what we did in the Roman Republic became a model just the same as you have a Senate today, where the representatives are supposedly elected and that they decide what it, supposedly decide what is best for the people. You have been watching, haven't you? Uh, why did you decide the Roman Republic could not continue to exist? <clears throat> I just thought there was too much turmoil. Keep in mind that I did not have any powers, essentially, until Julius was assassinated. I did not fully realize that he had named me as the heir of his will and that I would be taking over. Once... Caesar was assassinated. We once again were involved in fighting wars. Very huge battles took place. I thought that a combination of governing would be required. The people generally wanted to return to the concept of the Roman Republic. I felt that it also would take strong leadership. So I let the Senate have certain powers. I tried to influence the individuals who were elected to the Senate so that they would do what I wanted them to do. And I tried to remain more or less in the background as far as the people were concerned, but I wanted to continue to be the one that made most of the decisions. I felt that in many instances, the people did not understand what would be best in the long run for the Republic or for what was to become the empire. Will you tell us about your family? My father was a member of the Senate. He was involved in the politics of the time, became involved in much of the, in some of the infighting, became involved in some of the military actions. He passed at an early age. My mother was a very good woman. She did her best to raise me. But you have to understand that in those days, males participated in military activities at a very early age. I actually accompanied Caesar on several of his military expeditions. I was only 18 when he was assassinated. And I was really quite troubled about what I should do at that point. It was, you can imagine, a boy of 18 being thrown into a situation where he was supposed to take over control of the Roman Empire. So, My family tried to support me as best they could, but I was the one that had to make the decisions. Did you have recurring health problems? Yes. 
to, I was never that healthy an individual, even though I did live to be quite, quite old for the times. I had, I had respiratory problems and I would have, there would be periods of time that I would have problems breathing. I had problems. I had muscular problems as well to go with it. There were times that I would be actually bedridden. I, I wish that I had had better health because there were times that it certainly did affect my leadership. Why did Julius Caesar decide to adopt you and make you his principal heir? Mark Antony had been his closest associate and lieutenant. When Caesar was away, he would tend to leave Antony in charge of governing Rome, and Antony would make a mess of it. Antony was a great military leader. Of that there is no doubt. But he was not as good at working with the people, working with the Senate, and doing the administrative jobs that were required of such a large country. Caesar got very irritated with Anthony. And I think that he saw in me some leadership qualities, and he named me as his successor. Okay. As you said, you were only 18 when he was assassinated. Why did you think you could succeed in ruling the Roman Empire at such a tender age? I was never at a loss for self-confidence. I was very, I considered myself quite intelligent, and I was a very well-organized person. I knew that somebody had to do it. I didn't feel that I could do it by myself. In the beginning, I naturally assumed that Anthony would support me and that we would work together. What did take place is we, we would set up triumvirates where Anthony and I did govern for a period of time. At the, I knew that I did not have the experience to do what was required. But I thought that my relationship with Mark Antony would be much better than what it turned out to be. Yeah. What did you think when you heard that Caesar had been assassinated? It didn't overly surprise me. I knew that there were, there were many people that did not like the fact that Julius had made himself, had put himself in such a position of personal power. Keep in mind that even though there was a lot of dissension, the Senate was basically elected by the people. When Julius appointed himself dictator for life, it truly alienated many, many of the individuals in the Senate. It created a situation where many felt that such a radical departure from governmental principles would destroy, would basically destroy the country. So Julius brought a lot of it on himself. If he had, if he had been a little slower to assume such personal powers, things would have probably gone a lot better for him. But there was nothing weak about Julius Caesar. He had the greatest confidence in the world, and I think he truly felt that he was invincible. Okay. As you said, Mark Anthony was Caesar's chief lieutenant, and he expected to be his principal heir. Why did Caesar not make Anthony his principal heir? As I said, he, Anthony had alienated Caesar with his management and, and organizational abilities. I do believe that Caesar fully intended to make Antony his heir, but he was very, very irritated with him. Okay, how did Antony react when he learned that Caesar had adopted you as his son and named you beneficiary of his will? It infuriated him. He actually withheld my funds. 
He withheld a lot of the paperwork. Julius had offered or had made commitments to pay many of his centurions and many of the individuals in the legions. I had to try to raise funds to live up to some of Caesar's commitments. I think it shocked Mark that I was able to do that and to succeed. But it, until we came to an agreement, Mark did everything he could to, to assure that I would fail. Okay. What was your opinion of Mark Anthony personally? I've always felt that he was a great military leader, which he was. But I did not expect him to react so violently to the fact that I had been adopted by Julius. Mark was a very arrogant person. He felt that he was very important. He felt that he supplied the best leadership. And he felt that many of his decisions should not be questioned. I felt that Mark would be incapable of governing the, the, the empire. Okay. Brutus and Cassius were leaders of the Caesar assassination. What happened to the people that killed him? Brutus and Cassius raised their own armies. They had many legions and people that were, that were still their followers. There were many people that believed that the country was better off with Caesar dead. And there were many that were infuriated that, the, that Caesar had been assassinated. Brutus and Cassius raised legions and Antony and myself raised legions as well. And we fought a very, very bloody battle Brutus and Cassius were defeated, but it, many, many men were, were killed and injured in the fighting. Cassius, during the battle, thought that Brutus had been killed. So in those days, when people would be defeated, they would often commit suicide. So Cassius committed suicide, thinking Brutus was dead. That left Brutus's army very, very weak, and those that were following Cassius no longer wanted to be involved in the battle. So Brutus winds up committing suicide as well. How did you get the description of being merciless after the battle? I always did what I had to do. If I felt that people were threatening me and what I needed to do to win and to govern, then they would suffer some very violent situations. There was never any doubt that if Antony and I won the battle at Philippi, that we would have paraded Brutus and Cassius in the streets of Rome. That was customary. I would humiliate them. We would do everything that we needed to do in those days. Keep in mind that the, at that time, violence, violence was an incredible part of your life. Why did you think that you could share the leadership of Rome with Mark Anthony? In the beginning, I didn't feel like I had any choices, really. I wanted to participate in the leadership, but in the beginning, Mark was holding all the cards. As I told you, he had held back my some of my documents. He had held the money that was supposed to come with the estate. I couldn't proceed to take over a lot of the lands because he had clouded what was the legal track for me to do so. I didn't, in the beginning, I knew that I would not be strong enough personally to defeat Mark. I was always fairly good at reasoning out ways to accomplish what I wanted to do. So I felt that forming the triumvirate with 
Mark Anthony would be the only answer. And it did give me enough time to build up forces of my own and to accumulate the funds that I needed. Why did you have Anthony marry your sister, Octavia? I felt that it would keep him, shall we say, friendly towards our, towards our partnership in governing Rome. In those days, to make political relationships, you would have members of your family marry into the other individual that you wanted to have as part of that relationship. My sister Octavia was a wonderful woman, and I felt that if Antony married her, that it would help hold together the government, the triumvirate that we had put together. Why did he divorce your sister? Antony started to go to Egypt. We needed the grain. We needed some of the products that Egypt could offer us at the time. He met Cleopatra, fell in love, spent the winter with him, with her, began to have children by her at the same time that he was married to my sister. That, needless to say, did not make me very happy. Obviously. What effect did his relationship with Cleopatra have on your relationship with Mark Anthony? Well... He divorced her for Cleopatra. That really made me angry. Cleopatra was hated by the people of Rome. Antony had brought her to Rome. The people thought that he was going to marry her and make make her, shall we say, a princess. The people did not want any part of an Egyptian woman having control over them. Cleopatra was absolutely hated by the people of Rome. Did you ever meet Cleopatra? Yes, I met and I saw her. She was a beautiful woman. I will give her that. But she was... Cleopatra would do anything she needed to do to preserve her power in Egypt. Keep in mind that she had previously had a relationship with Julius and that they had had a child. Why did you declare war on Cleopatra, but not on Anthony? Anthony was was still had more popularity with the people of Rome. As I told you earlier, Cleopatra was hated by them. So when I declared war on Cleopatra, I was essentially declaring war on both of them. But with so much animosity towards Cleopatra, it made the it made the war much more popular with the people. What happened to Anthony and Cleopatra? We fought a major battle and my forces defeated them. Antony and Cleopatra both retreated to Egypt, but I followed them with my forces. Cleopatra thought that Antony had been killed, so she committed suicide. And when Antony realized that she had killed herself and it was inevitable that my forces were going to defeat him, he also committed suicide. Would you have killed them? I would have paraded them through the streets, and then, yes, they would have come to an end. Yeah. Do you see Antony and Cleopatra on the other side? We avoid each other over here. Okay. What was the first thing you did after securing your victory over Anthony and Cleopatra? I secure, I returned to Rome, and the people were overjoyed with the fact that I had been victorious. I took over, I started to take over command. They wanted me to basically become an emperor, which I did not want to be. I did not want to be associated with the fact of being an emperor. The people were still, still thought highly of Rome when it was, when it was part of the Republic. 
So I did not, I wanted to just basically do things that the people wanted to do to gain their favor at that time. Okay, let's take a small break here. We'll be back in about three minutes. Don't go away. Channeling History will return right after these brief messages. In order for the light to shine so brightly, the darkness must be present. Tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock. The Dark Sun Rising on the Para-X Radio Network. Hi, this is Marla Brooks from Stirring and Cauldron. Thursdays are a great night on the Para-X Radio Network. We start off the evening with Journey into the Light, Chapter 3, with your hosts, Psychic Little T and Tabby Cat Gash at 7 p.m. Eastern. Then, on the first and third Thursdays of the month at 8 p.m., it's Tango and Friends, hosted by Bruce Tango. And on the alternate Thursdays at 8 p.m., tune in to Stirring the Cauldron, the Archive podcast. Every week at 9 p.m. Eastern, join me on Stirring the Cauldron Live. And then at 10 p.m., stick around for New Aeon Now with Lily Alley, Davron Michaels, and Christine Matza. Finally, to round out the night, join Dr. Kelly Renee Schutz on the Paranormal Encounters podcast. All this, every Thursday, right here on Para-X. Have you ever wondered what Jesus and his followers would say if you could receive their messages today? In his new book, Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits, channeler and author Barry Strom answers those questions for you. Using his gift of spirit communication, he brings you messages from such holy spirits as Moses, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, Jesus, and even Mother Teresa and the Reverend Billy Graham. They discuss topics that are important for contemporary life in these troubled times. Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. Signed copies are available on the author's website, spiritspredict.com. After reading this book, you will never again say, What would Jesus say or do? Welcome back to Channeling History. Now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Okay, everybody, welcome back. We're going to carry on with our guest tonight. Connie, more questions. Kate's. Cleopatra had a son with Caesar. What happened to him? I had him executed. I know that sounds a little bit on the not too friendly side, but I did not want to take any chances that somebody could undermine what I was trying to do. I wanted any thoughts of any family members of Julius Caesar or Antony or Cleopatra coming back to take over the government, I wanted to at least feel secure that that was not going to happen. How did you consider your abilities as a military commander? I didn't think that I was that effective as a military commander. I always had some great people that were serving for me in the army that were very loyal to me. I had, I knew that I had individuals that I could trust. I tried to allow my military people to make the decisions that were necessary. I realized that when I had been in charge of armed forces that I had made some bad mistakes. So I tried to do what I was strongest at, and that was dealing with the people and dealing with the politicians and allow my military people to make military decisions. I have an interesting question from one of our listeners. She said, I wonder how Augustus would be received today and how he would govern with today's technology. I think I could do a pretty good job today. Keep in mind, I didn't have much help in ways of technology or assistance from others. 
I had the ability to understand what the people wanted of me. I had very good organizational skills. I think that I would make a really good modern politician. Okay. Uh, These battles that you were involved in were huge in size. At the Battle of Actium, where you defeated Antony, it is estimated that you had 400 ships and 80,000 in your infantry. How did you pay for and supply such a large army? By the time I went to war with Antony, I had been able to create a lot of wealth. I had many, many people that wanted to follow me. And Cleopatra had irritated so many people that I did not have a problem with with raising an army. Yes, it was a terrible time for warfare. When When we engaged Brutus and Cassius, They had close to 100,000 men in their military as well. It was a time of terrible, terrible bloodshed. I believe that we lost as many as a third of our men in the fighting. How active was Cleopatra in the Battle of Actium? I think that Cleopatra played a very large role. I was... My military was doing a good job in trapping Antony's people on land. Cleopatra had had a fleet of Egyptian ships, just the same as Antony had some ships. And I think she is the one that talked him into fighting the war at sea more than on land. I had a very, very good commander, and they trapped her ships, and they were defeating them badly. She actually broke the line of battle and escaped. Antony followed her with a few of his ships, but she was actively pursuing in the fighting. Would you tell us about the Pax Romana, or Roman peace? When I took over, the Roman people were incredibly tired of war. The civil wars had been going on for over 50 years, generations, did not know what it was like to live at peace. I did my best to bring peace to the Roman Empire. I made agreements with other countries. I tried to keep situations where we would not be invaded. We always had a few problems on the frontier, but I attempted to take care of those. What I did is I brought peace and prosperity to the people of Rome. Once I did this, trade took off. Individuals had a much better lifestyle. I built roads. I built sewers. I built aqueducts. I brought water to the people, healthy water to drink. I did so much for the people that others did not feel that they were in a position to really challenge us. Prosperity brings strength. I brought the people of Rome prosperity, and through that strength, that they could live in peace. It would be a lesson that I think some of your countries today ought to learn. You are correct on that. Okay, I may mispronounce this word, but would you explain the Roman concept of fides? That was that you would pledge the allegiance to a ruler or a co-ruler. Once that you pledge that allegiance, then you are honor-bound to live up to that pledge. I use this concept to bring peace. I would have individuals that would perhaps represent a future threat. Come to, I would come to an arrangement with them. I would give them something, and they would give me their pledge of support. Once I had that pledge of support, they were honor-bound to follow me 
and they would no longer be a threat to me. So I would do things for them and they would do things for me. But Fides was actually was a policy of honor and it was very, very helpful in creating the peace for the country. Yeah. Herod was king of Judea and supported Mark Anthony. After the defeat of Anthony, you allowed him to remain king of Judea. Will you explain how this took place? Herod knew that I would not take it real well, the fact that he had gone with Antony. As soon as he realized that Antony's troops were losing, he came to me literally with bags of gold. He promised that he would support me. He swore his allegiance to me. And in in return, I gave him properties in Judea and allowed him to be a cl- what we refer to as a client king. Essentially, he, I guess you would say, bought me, bought my goodwill, and he turned out to be actually a very good servant of mine. He realized that if he broke his agreement with me, things would not go well for him. So, Herod was a very, very wise politician. He knew which way the wind was blowing, and he would react accordingly. Okay, do you have anything else you could uh, explain to us about the client kings and how that worked? We did this with many people. They knew that I would accept money that they would bring. Gold was a big deal in my time. They would bring riches. They would guarantee that they would supply people for my legions. They would help protect us. And in return, I would give them lands and I would protect them as well with my legions. It was like a client-patient relationship. I guess that's the best way you could describe it. Okay. Uh, Jesus was born around 5 BC and was 19 years of age at the time of your passing. Were you ever aware of his existence? No, I was never aware of it. Okay. Herod carried out what is now referred to as the Massacre of the Innocents. Were you ever aware of this, that this event took place? I had, he had told me that there was an individual that was that he felt was going to was was born that would become the king of the Jews and would perhaps weaken the the relationship that I had with the Jewish community keep in mind that Herod was Jewish he said that he was going to try to locate the child and that he would terminate it so that I would not have any more risk. I did not realize that he was going to go out and kill all of the young male children. Yeah. Why did you never claim the title of emperor? Caesar got in trouble by try by taking the title dictator for life. I did not want the people to think that I would become a dictator as Caesar had done. The term emperor, I thought, insinuated that I would be taking over the dictatorship of the country. I preferred to influence the members of the Senate and the people that were working in the government. I what I did is I had individuals that were very friendly to me run for the Senate, and I assured that they would win their seats in the Senate. I put people in that I knew I could trust. I did not want to alienate the people, the common people. If I had taken the same, uh, roughly the same approach as Caesar, I don't think that I would have reigned 
for as long as I did. Yeah. Okay. In your time, you almost doubled the size of the Roman Empire. How did you do it without a major war? That's amazing. I did it by building relationships, and I did it through having a military so powerful that the other countries feared me. I would go to them, and I would offer them something that they wanted. It might be trade routes. It might be financial aid. But I would go in, and I would diplomatically set up situations where these people would become my allies. I expanded the empire without having to use great amounts of military force. Now, we did have a very strong army, and this army was feared. It was feared greatly. So I would use that army as a negotiating tool, but I wouldn't start by attacking. I would try to make arrangements with other countries that were a good deal for both of us. Your second wife, Scribonia, bore your only child, Julia. Will you tell us about Julia? Julia turned out to be a great disappointment to me. She, she took advantage of the fact that I had great wealth and that I was truly the individual that was making all the decisions for Rome. She had relationships with many men. She was not true to her husband. She did many things that I did not approve of. And I actually, I thought that she had disgraced me to the point that I actually banned her from Rome. What about your daughter, Julia? That is who we were talking about was Julia. She is the one who disgraced me. Oh, I am sorry. Okay, so you divorced her mother and married Livia, who had two sons, one of which was Tiberius. Why did you have your stepson, Tiberius, marry your daughter, Julia? I thought that he could control her. I knew that Julia was, was a wild individual. I knew that she would be very difficult. I saw leadership qualities in Tiberius, and I thought that he would be the one to take over when I could no longer govern. I truly hoped that I, I, yes, I did force Tiberius to marry her. He wanted no part of her, but I thought that, that he would be best to be married to Julia and that she would, shall we say, see the light. The marriage didn't last long. He divorced her, and my daughter was just a total disappointment. You formally adopted Tiberius in 4 AD and declared him your successor. As you watched from the other side, were you pleased with the way Tiberius governed? I thought Tiberius did a good job. I watched, and I realized that he did. He tried to do much of the things that I had attempted that I attempted to do. He tried to carry out on some of the policies that I that I had originated. He was not perfect. He did make many mistakes. But in those days, it was very, very difficult to govern. Rome, Rome was huge for its time. There was, I mean, I had had built roads to help trade. I had done many things to make it easier to govern. But I think that all things said that Tiberius did a pretty good job. After your death, the Senate appointed you a god. As you watched from the other side, did that appointment please you? Well, once I got to the other side, I realized truly that there was only one god. It was the policy of the Senate. To, they thought they were doing the leaders a great favor if they made them gods. But you see, there were many Roman gods. 
it was not until after my death that Jesus really started to speak of the fact that there was but a single God. Yes, the Jews believed there was a single God, but there was no way that the Roman people were going to adapt to the belief of the Jewish populace. So as I watched, I knew from the other side, as they were pointing me at God, I knew that that was not the way of things. So I guess part of my vanity said that it was a good deal. But where I was at that time, I knew that that was not not the way things were to take place. Augustus, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment? Peace. I consider setting the foundation for peace that would last for hundreds of years my greatest accomplishment. Before I took over, the people knew nothing but war. It was peace with other countries that truly allowed Rome to grow into the great empire that it was. I would have to agree with that. What do you consider your greatest failure? I think I should have accomplished even more than what I did. The fact that it was so difficult to rule. It took me many years after the death of Caesar to consolidate my powers. I wish that I had not attempted to work with Antony as long as I did. I think if I would have exerted myself earlier, I could have accomplished much more. Are you planning to reincarnate? It's a possibility. It's been a couple thousand years now, and I know that there's spirits over here are suggesting that I come back. There's a good possibility that in the near future I may return. I think that would be a good thing for humanity. What did you think as you watched rulers such as Nero and Calugia from the other side? I was sickened. I had done much for the people. I had tried to stay in the background. I led, in spite of all my great wealth, a fairly simple life. I didn't indulge in... I did not indulge in much of the things that Nero and Caliglia began to do. Nero and Caliglia were both sadists. They enjoyed hurting people. Now, I was not above doing what I needed to do, and I would hurt people if I needed to do it, if I felt that they were trying to undermine my authority. Nero and Caliglia lived lives of extra lives of extravagances they would abuse people they would try to do things for their own glory caliglia in particular was a t- was one of the worst rulers that rome ever saw so i was truly sickened as i watched from the other side I had wished that that the leadership of Rome had taken a different path. Okay, we have another question from one of our listeners. Said, "Are you proud of the fact that the aqueducts and the road systems still exist?" I had incredible people working for me. They were wonderful engineers. They knew what they were doing, and they built things that have lasted forever. And it's part of the road system, the aqueducts. I think, that still have people remembering me. Great. Um, Do you have a final message for us this evening? Yes. I would like to thank you, first of all, for allowing me to come through and speak. As I said earlier, it's been an awful long time since I've been able to have conversations with humans. I did my best. I thought that I had a set of morals that would that guided me when violence was required i was certainly not one person that ran away from it when 
I had to fight. I would fight. I did what was required for the people of Rome. You see, the difference between some of the leaders that followed and myself was I truly, truly cared about the people. I tried to improve their lives. I tried to do many things. I tried to set up a world for them where they would live in peace. Because I realized that wars did nothing but but distracted from lives of people. It's impossible to live comfortable lives of no fear if wars are continued taking place around you. You're seeing that today in your modern world. There are people who have weapons far beyond the imagination of anything we could conceive of. Now, yes, our battles were bloody. They were, they were fought with swords and javelins, arrows, cavalry. But we didn't have the ability to push a button and wipe humanity from the face of the earth. People have got to understand that they must coexist. That was a lesson I brought to Rome, and it brought peace for 200 years. If somebody would bring that concept to to you modern people, that you must live in peace, then I think all would be well. So thank you for allowing me to come through. I appreciate the opportunity. Should you wish for me to speak again, I'd be more than happy to do so. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think we definitely need you to reincarnate, sir. Well, thank you for that. Okay, folks, next week. We are going to interview George W. Bush, the 43rd President of the United States. We have some very, very interesting questions for him. I think if you have some, send them to me. You can send questions or suggestions for future guests to our email, channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com. My eighth book, Messages of God for a Modern World, is now available on Amazon. It's in soft cover. It's an e-book consists of 60 channeled messages from God that we got on our Wednesday podcast. It's uh, people that have read the book think it is quite good. I hope that you would take time to check it out. You can have it in soft cover or in Kindle. So I hope you enjoyed our show tonight. I'm glad to be back with you live again. I think that we got things under control, at least for me. So... Thank you for listening. Please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Network. And I would also like to thank you for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful week. God bless you all. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. Incompetech.com.